Good evening. I'm Mary Ann Gibson, and it's my great honor to welcome you to the Comprehensive Park Master Plan presentation to the public. And so, without further ado, I would like to just uh, announce a couple of folks that are here. Alderman Rocky Yonda, thank you for being here. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our liaison to the, uh, to the Parks and Recreation Commission, Alderman Forrest Owens. First, it is, it is my extreme privilege, and uh, I feel very fortunate to be the Alderman Liaison. Um, Mary Ann was kind enough to, uh, to give that up to me a couple of years ago, and, and I've enjoyed it greatly serving with our commission and with our staff. And I want to recognize two of the most important people in the room. First of all, Mr. Chairman Kevin Young. He's the chairman of our first commission, and a and has been for many years, and uh, he is single-handedly responsible for leading us into this, and also, of course, our Parks Director, Pam Beasley, who's going to give a little bit of an introduction. I will say, um, you're going to see some things tonight that are that are bold, and um, I think, I'm going to steal Pam's word, uh, transformative, and I ask that you all keep an open mind. Uh, we tasked, and I don't want to steal too much of your thunder, Pam, but we tasked our consultants with, with being, uh, preparing a plan that would be for the next not five years, not 10 years, but 20 years and beyond. And, and we, of the steering committee members, had a sneak peek at that last night, so I did get a little bit of a, a presentation before you guys, and, and I'm, I'm very pleased with what I see, and I hope you will be too. And without that, any further ado, Pam? Hey there, everybody. I'm looking out at this audience, and I can tell you, I know most all of you here, either by name or because I've seen your faces, because in this audience, we have the supporters of our parks here in Germantown. And so uh, I echo what Alderman Owens has said. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. We're going to try to accomplish a couple of things tonight. One is we're going to unveil what we call a preliminary draft. We can't move forward until you all have something to react to. So again, keep an open mind and understand that there are so many possibilities um, that they really are just endless. First of all, I want to say how excited I am that we have put together a team of professionals like no other, I'm going to say in the country, and they're not even paying me to say this, uh, but the team, as they introduce themselves, you're, you're going to understand very quickly um, that they come from many different backgrounds and they've had experiences with so many different cities and municipalities across the country and even internationally. And so we've asked them to bring their best ideas and their best practices forward and help us understand what that could mean for our city. Um, I've lived here for a long time now, and I'm, I'm very proud to own a home here in Germantown. This is, this is my place as a child. Uh, I, my dad was in the Air Force, and I lived all over the world. Um, but this is home for me, and so not only am I passionate about our parks, but I certainly am passionate about our city. So when we hired this team of professionals, I said, you know, We've got to accomplish several things. Number one, our parks need to be highly functional. They need to be accessible, and they need to be beautiful. And because that's who we are here in Germantown, anyone that I've ever talked to that has traveled into our city said, when you drive into Germantown, it feels different. Would you all agree with that? Well, our park system, they're going to explain how we can transform into that unique and that different. Where we might have been in the past, we're not necessarily there today. So there are many options for us to look at. One of the other things I ask them to consider because I feel confident in saying that we are a city of tradition and heritage and preservation. So I've asked them to pay attention to that. And really the public, during our surveys and engagement, you all said that. You also said that interacting with your neighbors and special events is really our niche here in the city. Some cities do um, big sports events. Uh, some, some cities have uh, 
racing tracks, some cities have gambling establishments, some cities have their niche. We're special events. We have some of the finest special events in the country. The Cherry Horse Show, the Germantown Festival, our holiday parade, our July 4th, many things that are, are coming uh, into fruition with our Germantown Performing Arts Center. Um, so we have so much potential there. Um, but finally, uh, many of our parks, because of the growth, they, they really don't support that flow, traffic, parking. So from a functional standpoint, we've got to fix that too. Um, so I'm really excited to present this team. Um, be bold, be beautiful. I think our future has got a lot. Thank you.
uh, Germantown becoming diverse, slowly but surely, uh, we're seeing more diversity here. And you have extremely high rates of home ownership and household value. <coughs> Very low poverty. And while you're growing, uh, you may not be growing as fast as some of your surroundings. And what I mean by that, you can see in this chart, going from 1980 on the left up to 2016 on the right, uh, you see a, a steeper growth in, in the 80s and even in the 90s, but recently that growth trend is flattening out. So when we compare Germantown to Shelby County, uh, Germantown is the purple and, Germ and Shelby County is the blue shade. Uh, you can see that while Shelby County as a whole is growing uh, steadily, the growth trend in Germantown is kind of somewhat flat. So that tells us that you may be approaching a build-out scenario. If we look at age groups and broken down by gender, we see two uh, large groupings. The one at the top is between age groups 50 to 79, and at the bottom, you've got school-age children from 5 to 19. And that's, that's really going to inform our recommendations in, in terms of programming and facilities that you need. Race and ethnicity may break down. Uh, this compares Germantown to the state of Tennessee. Uh, it's very low minority, but in this next slide, you can see that diversity is increasing over time. This is 2000, 2010, and 2015 for comparison. Housing and income. This is a really good example of the fiscal health of your community. You have a lot of resources. Uh, if you look at this column, this is Germantown statistics, home ownership rate of 86%. If you look at Shelby County, the Memphis metro area in Tennessee, that far exceeds those other uh, measurements. If you look at the median value of occupied housing, it's tremendous when compared to those other uh, geographic areas. Your per capita income is extremely high, almost double the three other uh, statistics. And median household income is almost double as well, actually more than double, like 144,000. And extremely low poverty. So with this type of premier residential <coughs> community, your parks and recreation facilities should reflect that character. So the next task we had was to perform a gap analysis. And what that basically is, we look at your existing facilities, uh, your, all your parks, all your greenways, and we assign service areas to those to see if there are any parts of your community that are currently underserved. So here's a map of your existing facilities. We, we've broken your parks down by category, everything from mini parks, neighborhood parks, school parks, and then larger community parks, and then your specialty parks like your natural areas and your sports complexes. We've also mapped your existing greenway here. When we apply those service areas of varying size depending on the park category, this, these bubbles kind of show the areas of the community that are currently served. Now, the only area that is not covered by any type of park is the extreme southeast corner of the community. And that's really reflected in a lot of the public input we receive. We also see some gaps in your greenway, which was reflected over and over again with the survey and public input. Uh, you can kind of see the linear bubble. Um, we've obviously got good coverage across the north end of the, of the community along the Wolf River, but there's a gap going east to Collierville, and then the eventual plan to close an entire loop around the city is not complete yet. But once that does, uh, once that is completed, you'll have much better coverage in terms of greenway access. So I'll turn it back over to John. Okay, so I just want to recap some of the public input information that we heard, some of the comments. I do want to say um, this is going to be available online for you all to look at too, so I'm not going to hit every topic just in the interest of time so we can get to the stuff I think that would be most interesting to you. But I do want to hit on some kind of important things that will also tie into what we heard in the survey as well. You know, we asked people, you know, what, what they believe is unique about the city of Germantown and what quality that, that makes it unique. I won't read all of these, you can see them, but some of the comments involve, you know, public services, safety, and the community feel. Safety was a common theme that we heard, you know, throughout a lot of our comments that we, you know, that we saw. You know, a great place to raise a family, strong school system, and a safe community. Trees, landscaping, and beauty. A strong sense of community. Community, safety, you know, uh, schools were mentioned several times. The charity horse show. 
Um, so, you know, those were a lot of the things that people felt made you unique and made you special. During our steering committee process, we asked them to identify what they felt like were challenges or issues that were facing your parks. And some of those comments involved, you know, wear and tear on grass fields, um, a need to evolve to draw all ages. The comment there was tied to, you know, kids graduate and go to college, and then they don't come back until they're ready to start a family. And so what happens with those 20 year olds and how do you kind of keep them here as well? Um, so they felt like there was a need to, that's a challenge, it's something that they needed to address. Uh, and then, you know, others funding funding for the park system. Um, you know, some what, what were the solutions? Um, things like a community commitment and flexibility. You know, we have a lot of different user groups, so how do we accommodate everybody that's in this community, you know, with their specific interest? Um, you know, a reallocation of assets, creating spaces to host multiple events for all ages. During our open house, for those of you who participated, you might remember, might remember we had some buckets on the table and we had some priorities. And these are some of those priorities. And these were the priorities that we felt like were the top tier things. You know, of, of a list of 200, this represents the top, um, I think there's seven, eight maybe there, um, that we felt like were really the big issues. And so we wanted to kind of see how those, how people felt about some of these issues. So in the parentheses, at the end of each of those is the number of votes that those things got. You all had chips that you were able to drop in a bucket as many as you wanted. The first one being improvements and maintenance of existing neighborhood and community-based parks and recreation facilities. Overwhelmingly by three times, everybody said, that's important. Um, improvements and maintenance of existing walking and biking facilities. Development of new walking and biking facilities. Development of tournament level athletic facilities outdoor and the same thing for indoor. Um, and then development of new neighborhood and community-based parks and recreation facilities and then parkland acquisition rounded that, those up, rankings up. Important activities that are not being provided. So these were things um, that people were able to put some dots next to images and activities for you know, what they felt like they would like to see but they don't have access to right now. And I just highlighted a few. Play pick up field sports for fun. We had 29, 29 votes for that. Sitting outside, reading, people watching, eating lunch. Uh, playing pick up court sports for fun. This is like not organized, just being able to walk into a park and, and play, you know, play some kind of a court sport. Interacting and playing with others in a water spray type situation. Playing league organized court sports. When we took that to the next step and talked about programs, what kind of programs? Well, some of our top votes there had to do with outdoor dining, um, community special events, concerts, green markets. And then the Germantown Charity Horse Show, which was a write-in that day that someone wrote in, and then it, it ended up getting a lot of votes as well. Um, so, you know, these were some of the things that people really wanted to see. And I, and I highlighted these because these were themes that we were hearing in various different stages of our process. So some general comments, not necessarily tied to anything in particular. Improvements to existing soccer facilities, turf fields like Collierville. Need for pickleball courts. Need for more soccer fields for practice need for indoor spaces for socialization, and places for canoeing and kayaking. Talking about water access, you have a lot of water in your parks, and not a lot of places that you can access that water, you know, in some form or fashion. So those were some general comments. A couple more here, need for splash pads. Um, and then this last one at the bottom, many, many, many comments on connectivity and, uh, you know, greenway expansion. Um, the Mayor's Bicycle, Pedestrian, and Walkability Task Force, which has been put together to really look at the bike and pedestrian initiatives around the city. Uh, they've been working for months now on that. They have sent us a memo of their recommendations, and all of those are consistent with the many comments that we heard as well. So we're definitely um, endorsing that and feel like you know the city should really move forward with a lot of those. And, and they're looking at everything from intersection improvements to allow people to cross safely to bike lanes to sidewalk, you know, expansion and connections to really connect your community up better than it is today. So I'm going to let Carlos now talk about the survey findings and tell you a little bit about that. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. As John mentioned, my name is Carlos Perez. I'm the president of Perez Planning and Design. We're a planning and design firm that focuses on parks planning, trails planning, and design. We work all over the country. We've worked with over 80 communities uh, nationwide on these types of projects. Uh, communities such as downtown San Diego, Seattle, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Miami, and now we're getting the opportunity to work for Germantown, which we're very excited about. So my role in this project was to help the team develop a public engagement strategy and also along 
to you about that now, what the findings of that process was, um, and share what, uh, what we learned from that. So what we, we heard from over 700 of you in the community, which, as John mentioned, is really, really good for a community of this size. In fact, as John mentioned, we had never heard so quickly and so of so many people in a project that we've worked on before, which was really, really great. Um, as the survey went on, uh, the response rate went down a little bit, that's typical, um, but we still had a really, really great response rate, which we were very pleased with. You can see in this graph here what the majority of the respondents, what the age group of that was, so it ranged from 45, I'm sorry, 35 to 54. So if you remember what uh, Will talked about before in terms of what the two bulges were in your demographics, that was one of them. But what's interesting is what's missing is this group, the under 25 year respondents, right? That was another bulge that we saw in the demographics. However, when we asked participants to identify how many people lived in their household that were under 25 years old, when everyone inserted that number, 48% of that number were had, had uh, uh, people under 25 years old which is really great. So what, we're, what we believe is that this group right here that responded had this group in mind when they were responding to the survey. That's, that's what we hope. And then that's the way the questions were worded. The questions were worded, what are the priorities for you and members in your household, right? So we feel we had a really good response uh, in the survey. So if I were to tell you the three big findings of what we learned in the survey, these would be it. The first one was what we heard from participants was that you wanted to improve, enhance, and expand your parks and recreation facilities, right? Something to the level of the premier reputation and city that you live in now. As, as John will mention later, through our analysis, we learned that the parks were just not doing that. They were not to the level that you have an expected private development. So we heard loud and clear from the survey that you want to improve it, expand it, uh, enhance it. And part of expanding that requires land acquisition, and you'll see that in a second. So that's big idea number one. Big idea number two is you want it to be connected to these facilities as well as other places in town. So you want it to walk there, bike there, um, in a safe way. Uh, so you'll hear that uh, as well. That second one is one that we hear all the time across the country. Pedestrian access connectivity is always on the top. In fact, it's to the point now that we know that's what we're going to hear for number one. So we're actually really curious about what's two, three, four, and five because we know one is always going to be. So that was part of this. Included in that is this desire of accessing nature. And that's typical of a community that is slowly urbanized, right? As you become, as more people move in, there's a desire, potentially perception that some areas, some of those green spaces are going away. And there's also a desire to be, enjoy those natural areas. So that's also uh, something that we see about. So that's big idea number two. Big idea number three is the provision of special events and opportunities for the community to come together and enjoy these spaces and also to let you know about it. And you'll see here in a, in, a question, uh, in a question here in a second where we ask about what prevents you from visiting these facilities, and you'll see the response to that, which leads us to believe that marketing is, is a major need. Um, and that's something typical in the industry right now. Parks and Recreation Departments um, have a challenge nationwide marketing their, their services. A lot of them have limited budgets. They have a lot of uh, amenities and facilities that they provide the residents. So the struggle is, well, how can we maximize our dollars to let people know? So that's something that we'll provide recommendations for. So those are the big three ideas. What I'd like to do now is just take you through a few of the questions that highlight some of these uh, key points that we felt were important uh, for you to, to see. Okay. So the next one, one of the, the first question was when we asked what the top values were from the community. Um, and we asked that at the steering committee. We asked that about stakeholders as well. And we asked it in the survey as well. So you can see that the first top five are this idea of sense of safety, sense of community, high quality public services, cleanliness, this idea of small town atmosphere with big town amenities. So you love this idea of Germantown as a really small place, but you want those amenities that you find in an emergency. Then we also ask, well, what's preventing you from using these facilities and what's preventing you from going to these programs? And the top two were, I don't know what is offered and I don't know what locations and again, that's something typical that we see across uh, the industry. So it's a combination of providing some recommendations for marketing, uh, marketing as well as signage and wayfinding as well. Then we also asked uh, folks to identify what activities they felt they needed more of, already had enough of, or uh, um, had there was too many. Right? Those were the three, three options that you could select. And we 
you're seeing here is an option that people said they needed more of. So just to mention a few of them, play with others in a splash pad. You've just heard that before uh, from the steering committee. Um, ride a bike, dog park, sitting outside, people watching, playing with others around table games, drawing natural areas, being paths, etc. So these are some of those uh, top needs that we hear. However, then we ask people, well, out of all these needs, what are your, your uh, four most important? had to select four most important, what are those? And so what you're seeing here is the top four of that first choice. Then you're seeing the top four of that second choice, top four of the third choice, and the top four of the fourth choice. But what you can see very clearly through the colors is the ones that repeat themselves. So you can see that there's a lot of repetition when folks say, what are your top four? So walking, jogging, trails are, are a big one. Natural areas is another big one. Playing soccer fields and, and baseball and soccer uh, were, were uh, in the top, um, but then repeat, but they're still in the top. And then sitting outside, people watching. So a lot of this is typical of urbanizing communities that we see across the country. Okay? So those are the top from activity standpoint. We said the same thing for programs. What programs do you want to see more of? What do you think there's too many of? Um, and this is what we heard. We heard how for dining, community special events, movies in the park, team programs, cooking classes, et cetera, as programs. That were you needed more of. However, when we asked, okay, what are those? What are your top? These were the top four. So again, you're seeing the top four of that first choice, the top four of that second choice, the top four of the third choice, the top four of the fourth choice. And again, here you can see the repetition. Community special events came out in a lot of places. Outdoor dining came out in a lot of places. Youth athletic leagues came out in a lot of places. So this represents the top of those. Then through the stakeholder interviews, um, through the steering committee, uh, and through other interviews, we asked folks, well, what are some actions, some ideas that you have about improvements that the city can make in the park system? So we, we got a whole list of those. And we included those in the survey because we wanted to get input on what some of those were. And these were the ones that uh, came up uh, at about 50% of the participants. So over 50% of the participants said they were very supportive of these facilities. The others were under 50%. But that included further developing and renovating existing parks and recreation facilities is top one, developing new greenways and trails, second one, acquiring land for greenways and trails, um, expanding park resources to improve the existing facilities, um, acquiring land for recreation facilities, and then increasing funding for, to improve all these. Okay. But like we did before, we said, okay, well out of all those, what are your top five? What would be the top five that you like? And again, what you're seeing here is the top five of the first choice, Top five of the second choice, top five of the third choice, top five of the fourth choice, and top five of the fifth choice. And again, the colors represent those that, that you start seeing over and over. So further developing and renovating existing park you see all over again, or a lot of. You see developing greenways and trails repeated quite a bit. Acquiring land repeated quite a bit. So those are some of those. Then we asked folks, well, how would you, we gave you extra hundred dollars. How would you allocate those hundred dollars between these? And so $23 of those $100 were going to improving and enhancing for parks. The next 20 were going to improving bike facilities, 18 developing new facilities, another 18 going to developing new walking and biking trails, and a 15 <coughs> park acquisition. So you can see how this theme of improving, enhancing, renovating, expanding keeps coming over and over again through the, the survey. And the last two questions, we asked folks, well, would you be willing to pay more taxes for these facilities? that are important to you. And 72% of you said yes, you would be willing to pay more taxes, which we thought was really great. Then we asked, well, how much would you be willing to pay? That's always the question. <laughs> and this was really great too. So we heard, if, if, you were, if we were to summarize it, what we heard is 48% of respondents said they would be paying, willing to pay at least $1 a month of additional taxes. 48% additional $1. If we were to break that down a little more, 21% of you said, one to five dollars per month. Um, and 26 percent said six to ten dollars per month. Right? But then you see that 51 percent said they'd be willing to pay eleven dollars or more a month in increased taxes for these facilities. So that was we thought that was really positive and it shows up shows a, a pent up demand to see and enhance the park system uh, in the city. So again in summary what we heard from this technique was enhance, expand, improve what we have connect me to those facilities, and then organize community events so I can participate in those things. Okay, so 
and now we're going to get to the good stuff, which you all came for. We're going to talk a little bit first about some of our general observations. Yeah, as a design team, when we went out and visited the parks and looked at your parks, and I'll say that you know there were common issues that we see in all park systems with accessibility and, and you know um, dated some dated facilities. But I'll say of the good things first. You know you have a great mix of unique facilities. Um, you know you have the charity horse show, which puts on great events that we've not seen in any other community that we've worked in. You have the farm park. You have some really unique features in your park system that other communities don't have. And you have great access to miles of greenways, which is, which is incredible. This is a comment, though, that and Carlos alluded to this a, a little bit ago. We feel like your parks are not consistent with the Germantown identity. Um, you know, you have a very high standard here in terms of what you, do, you require in your private development community. It's why your community looks the way it does. And we don't feel like your parks reflect that. I think at one time they did. You know, in looking at the parks, a lot of the facilities, you know, you can tell were probably put in relatively about the same time. Uh, but it's been it's been a few years, and I guess my big comment there would be, you've loved them to death, and it's uh, you know it's it's time for an update. I know that's why we were brought here, um, and that's why we had so much participation from you know most of you. Is I think you all are recognizing that too. So. I'm going to get into the, the specific park recommendations. We looked at three parks that are really um, um, pivotal. You know, they're, they're the ones that kind of help all of it work together. But I'll talk a little bit about some of the comments we heard first specific to these parks. And these just represent a snapshot of all the comments we got. Those of you who participated that night in the open house, we had pages of comments relative to each individual park in the city that you were able to look at, and then even general comments. So we're going to start with Municipal Park. Um, and you know, one of the comments I've highlighted to you, outdoor concert venue, city gatherings, more activities, movies in the park, wide greenway boulevards, the need to tie the amenities together that are within the park. You know, one of the things we've heard a lot about relative to municipal park, um, or that could be applicable to municipal park, is you don't have a downtown like a lot of communities. And so there's this desire to have some kind of a central place that people identify with Germantown. You have all of your you know, um, city facilities here, so you know, how do we make the park kind of fit that fit that niche? And I'm gonna, I'll just generally go over this, and we have a, a couple blow ups, and I'll also tell you that at the end of the meeting, we have some mats on tables that we're going to give you an opportunity to look at it up close, and we can respond to questions that you may have. But I'll just kind of start big picture first. You know, this is this is Germantown Road. This is Exeter Road back here. This is the public library up in this corner. We're here tonight. Um, the Germantown Athletic Club, the Performing Arts Center right here. So just to give you a little bit of orientation, this is your existing lake, this uh, kind of gray spot here. So you might notice, some of you that are looking at it, um, tennis courts. Your tennis courts are currently located right here. So we recommended taking tennis courts out of the municipal park. They are, they do, you know, they do fit a need tied to the athletic club, but in terms of this overall park, they don't really fit in that park in terms of what you would see for a future use of the park. You know, if this becomes something that people identify with Germantown, we're looking at it as a large open entertainment space where you can host different sizes and special events. So some of the features, you know, what we'd really like to see is as you come down Germantown Road, right now some of the comments we heard is you don't necessarily know that there's a park back there. It's kind of hidden. You see the tennis courts, so that sort of alerts you that there's a park, but you have no idea that all this green space exists back behind you know, where the tennis courts are. So what we're recommending is that you come down Germantown Road, a distinct architectural feature. We're showing a, um, a fly, what we're calling a flyover pedestrian bridge. And if you look at these images here on the right, this is what comes up when you Google awesome pedestrian bridges. So, uh, and so these are just a few images, but our idea is that this would be um, you know, an icon for the city of Germantown. And what happens is this bridge comes up you know, into the air and and connects up to what we're calling an overlook plaza that gives you a vantage point over the entire park. Um, and I'm gonna go to the next slide because we actually zoom into some of these areas. So looking at this space, this is this is the uh, the flower bridge that I mentioned. This is where the tennis courts currently exist, gen you know, generally speaking. We're showing in this location a splash pad. We've heard a lot of comments about you know the desire for splash pads in the community. So we're showing a splash pad here adjacent to your, to your lake. 
you know, this flyover bridge comes up over top of the splash pad, so you'd have a vantage point looking down and seeing the <coughs> plan of the splash pad. We're, um, we're showing some nice gentle lawns for, you know, smaller community events, lounging in the grass, whatever, whatever it may be. We're also showing along here some, some additional parking, but we're also seeing the infrastructure being put in place for food trucks. You know, the ability during special events to have food trucks, the ability that through the week you can have a few huge food trucks there. People could go there, pick up a meal, and go have lunch in the park. We heard a lot of comments about, it. we'd like to have some outdoor dining opportunities. We'd like to people watch, we want to sit and watch. So we're kind of accommodating uh, something to allow that activity to happen. If we move to the north side of the park, and the library is just off to the side of the screen here, this is Exeter Road, uh, we're looking at a couple of small, well, this is a rather large uh, outdoor amphitheater. And then we have a smaller, more intimate amphitheater here adjacent to the library. We think we could have some outdoor education, outdoor readings. But the other bigger idea about these two, um, these two spaces is that the Performing Arts Center is planning an amphitheater you know, up to the other side of their building. And we really see these being support amenities to that, to that amphitheater. The idea being if you were hosting a large community event here, you could have multiple stages and multiple activities going on. Um, and so these would all you know, cater to each other in that, in that idea. Right here at number 14, we're showing a large playground. And we're calling this a destination playground. This would be something that people will come a little bit of a distance to, to, to participate on because it's unique um, and would cater to a variety of ages. You know, we're showing walking trails and connecting up all of this park. You'll notice Exeter Road, plans for Exeter Road are looking at reducing those lanes and getting some on-street parking and making it much more pedestrian you know, friendly than it is now. They're showing a median with some, uh, some pedestrian plazas. So the idea would be when you're having a large event, Exeter Road could actually be closed from end to end or nearly from end to end and could be spillover space from this park where you could have you know, vendors, tents, food trucks, whatever. You know, it, it's endless what you could really do with Exeter Road in that amount of space, and it really makes this park an extreme extension. One of the things we struggle with in the municipal park is that you're giving up a lot of valuable parkland to surface parking. And you know, there's that whole question of, you know, have you reached a point in the, you know, are you urban enough that you move to parking garages there? You know, that's really a struggle. What we what we looked at is removing some of the parking and just recapturing some of that space for green space. So this dash line shows where we're removing about 64 parking spaces, but along the plans along Exeter Road call for the addition of 115 on-street spaces. So while you're losing 64 here, you're not losing anything that you're going to be gaining in, in the Exeter Road plans. So um, that's the general overview for the municipal park. And like I said, after the meeting, you're going to have an opportunity to look at it up close on the tables and and give us some comments. So we'll move on to what we're calling the, the Parks on Poplar Pike, <coughs> Parks on Poplar Pike, which includes the Charity Horse Show, Oak Lawn Garden, um, the two soccer complexes, and uh, the Bar Park. Some general comments that we got, better entrances to the parks that connect all of them. All the different uses in those parks, those each operate in a silo. There, there's not enough parking, they're not connected in any way, so you can't get from one to the other. Um, I've, I've shared this with several people. I have three kids, and I'm thinking about it. They're all different ages. And I'm thinking about those two soccer complexes and what it would be like to try and run back and forth between those two, those two complexes if I have a kid playing in different age groups. And there's not an easy way to do that. So you know, we're really looking at how we can improve that. Um, you know, specific to those, the Germantown soccer complex was the desire for more fields. Um, to make them publicly accessible artificial turf fields like they do in other communities. Um, the desire of under employees, a comment we had was move junior soccer to connect it with the soccer place. Well, that's not really easy to do because we have this little thing called the farm park in between. So, uh, you know, we can't, we can't exactly accommodate that uh, very easily. And then at the farm park, just better access and signage, have entertainment, concert shows, and the farm park lawns were some of the comments that we heard there. You know, talking specifically about Oak Lawn, you know, too many sports. Keep the trees. Keep Oak Lawn and Botanical Garden. Um, you know, use the back pasture of Oak Lawn. would be a wonderful place for music engagements. Uh, we could picnic and enjoy live music there was a comment we had. You know, talking about the charity horse show. Adding barns and rings to the horse show grounds. Um, you know, these need to grow so that they can continue to contribute to the community economically as it does now. 
So we're going to get into the parks on Poplar. And again, I have um, you know blow-ups of these areas, but just to generally orient you, this is the Charity Horse Show, the, the big arena there and the barns behind. This is C.O. Franklin Park. Um, right now there are tennis courts in this general location. You'll notice those are also you know no longer there. This is the Oak Lawn Botanical Garden. Um, currently, the soccer flex is in this space. This is the farm park. And then this is um, Cloy Soccer Complex here. So we'll move on to the, to the blow-ups. So starting down um, at the Charity Horse Show property, we've removed the tennis courts from this area and, are, and recaptured this open lawn space. We really see this, this is, becomes the main entry into the entire 100 acres. So we really wanted to see this be a, you know, a nicer entry as you come in. We're showing a formal promenade that really brings a focus and attention to the entry pavilion at the, um, at the Charity Horse Show. Uh, but again, it, it creates some open space there. Uh, another point of reference, this is the Pickering Center where we met for the public meetings and the Genealogy Center here. So we looked at, um, Charity Horse Show has done some, they've done some plans, some preliminary plans for some expansion. So we, we tried to uh, tried to honor some of what they're looking to do by expanding some, some of the horse rings, adding some barns, and again, by capturing this green space, allowing by taking tennis out, we felt like it also allows for some overflow into this space as well. This area represents Morgan Woods. So we're, we're showing, maintaining Morgan Woods with walking trails and nature trails. What you can't really see even at this scale is that we have, we're showing a lot of trails that are connecting up all of these various spaces. So as a user, you could park anywhere and easily walk on trails that connect you up to the gardens, to the farm park, uh, and, and beyond. We're showing some additional parkings and adding a couple 50 spaces here. We're showing adding some spaces here, which is associated with Oak Lawn Gardens. We really see this being the main entrance into the garden. We, um, we'll move to the next slide. This is again Oak Lawn Garden. So we're showing some new buildings here that would you know, serve as a visitor center, welcome center, uh, the potential for possibly greenhouses, um, you know, doing some of that. Really maintaining the garden the way it is, but improving it with trails and, and honoring you know, that space. One of the things I didn't mention about the municipal park is the John Gray House. We have a lot of comments about the John Gray House. Contextually, it doesn't really fit into a municipal park now, and doesn't fit into the future plan so well either. So we're recommending that that move and be part of, become part of Oak Lawn Garden. It becomes a backdoor entrance to Oak Lawn, and we have some adjacent green spaces where you could do you know, smaller, smaller, more intimate um, special events on those spaces. What we're also showing here, and this is the current location of the Floyd Soccer Complex, or the, the couple fields there, <coughs> is parking. We have a centralized parking lot that as you come into this main park road, you're able to feed into all of these spaces from that parking. This is currently shown at about 700 spaces. With our first preliminary conversations this week, what we're thinking we're going to do is scale this back and make more green in here, but make it where it can serve as overflow for parking when you have large events. So that you're not really surface parking all of this, but rather having more green that, that, can, that can meet that parking need. We're showing a more kind of organized and formal entry into the farm, into the farm park, with also, also with another splash pad. So this really becomes a family destination place where you know kids have the splash pad, and we really honored um, the farm park master plan. They've been implementing that plan; it's a good plan, and we really just see carrying that plan forward. So that's what's represented in this space. This becomes a, what we're calling a large, could be open air type pavilion, but maybe to another scale that could be used for weddings or really you know upscale events. The idea being that those events could spill into this open lawn or into the garden or utilize both spaces. This is the existing house at the farm park. Um, we're recommending that that house either be renovated to be used for special events or you know, the house may not be conducive to that. And you may be a tear down and you start over, but using the architecture and the vernacular for the space, we still think you need something like that. And so it could also cater to that desire for indoor spaces for socialization that we heard about. And so we've provided some adjacent parking that could, that could service that. We've provided a drive that comes up and serves as like a service drive to the existing barns that are up there. Um, drainage is an issue here, and we've heard a lot about that. So we're, we've looked at how the how you know preliminary how the grading works on this site, how the topography works. So we're looking at how we could 
redirect that water and create some features that kind of manage the stormwater in a different way. And so there's walking trails and some bridges across some what would be water features in the park. Moving up to the north side, this is the soccer complex, or the, the soccer flex. We're recommending a tennis center. We've taken tennis courts out of Municipal Park, we've taken tennis out of C.O. Franklin Park, and we're recommending that we do more of a complex with those all consolidated in one space. The reason for this is that they can be programmed, they can be scheduled. Um, currently, we're told that people are driving from one park to another on an evening looking for a place to play tennis. If we can put these all in one location, it gives the opportunity to schedule them and for people to sign up to have a court that they know they'll have a place to play when they get there. So that's the idea of that. We have the existing parking of the soccer flex, which is adequate to serve this uh, tennis court, so it would be maintained as it is. This dash line represents a possible future indoor tennis, all thing court type complex, possibly. It's moving down the road 20 years from now, maybe sooner, maybe longer. You decide that there's a need for that. We've just allocated the space. Until that time, it's just another open green space for people to just enjoy being in the park. Um, we are showing the relocation of the pro shop that we have currently in Municipal Park that would be in this location to serve the tennis courts. Moving to Cameron Brown and Bob Haley Athletic Complex. This is another one that we had a lot of comments about. Um, you know, some of those involved a complete overhaul. <laughs> Uh, you know, a two-mile greenway within the park. You know, again, perimeter greenways in the park. And, and other comments. Yeah. So to orient you, this is the existing Cameron Brown Park and baseball fields. Uh, these are the, there's an existing, I believe, two tennis courts in this location. This is the parking. I would say the biggest comment we heard about this park is it is a disaster when you have a lot going on there in terms of parking. Uh, and dangerous for kids especially. So, you know, how could we fix that problem? Um, what we've recommended is a youth, basically a youth baseball and what also could serve a uh, youth girls softball um, need here in the community. Um, so we're recommending the development of a four t-ball field which could double for youth girls softball. Um, we're recommending a five field, 220 feet, uh, foot field complex. This represents additional parking. This is a dog park with parking that would also serve these, these new fields, as well as a connection to the Greenway. In this location of these two lone tennis courts, we're recommending the development of a pickle court uh, complex. We have a lot of comments from pickleball players. So we're showing eight pickleball courts in this location. Um, another point I'd like to make is that if any of you are familiar with this or been to these parks, there's a black dash line here around each of these. And that represents what is currently cleared on, on the property. So basically, we could fit this smaller five field complex and parking within the footprint of the existing larger fields that are out there now that are not really being utilized in the way that they were originally planned for back when you built that complex, however many years ago it's been. Uh, so we're really looking for that. You know, who does this displace? This is existing football. So we're gonna talk about, you know, where, where's football? How do we accommodate the football needs? moving beyond this park. The thing that I want to talk about here is that none of this can really happen without some parkland acquisition. Um, it's, it's really imperative for you to be able to grow and accommodate all your users, you know, with to have some additional parkland. Um, the biggest issue is we could probably mandate some of what you have, we could update it and renovate it, but it isn't going to really meet the needs of your users that are out there now and that we anticipate will be coming into the community as you move forward in this plan 10 years, 20 years down the road. So what we've developed here is a concept for a 45 acre site. It's really just to look at how could you maximize that site, how many fields could you get on that site. With some of our recommendations, we've displaced football, we've displaced uh, lacrosse, we've displaced soccer. So we have to find a place where we can put those users uh, and meet their needs. So that's what this attempts to do. This basically shows 10, 10 fields, and these are basically sized the same size as the soccer flex, which I'll say is good for youth soccer, but undersized for kids that get a little bit older. Um, we're also showing four full-size fields, and then the parking to accommodate the needs for those fields. Um, so this expands, you know, your your abilities to meet lacrosse and soccer for sure on this, lo this location. 
This is shown as, um, this, this particular property has been looked at as a regional detention for this area of town. And I'll also mention that this, this particular parcel is in an area of town where we show an underserved population and a gap in our, you know, in our gap analysis. So this has been shown for regional detention um, that has already been looked at. So we wanted to make sure that we could accommodate that regional detention. If it has to happen here, we want to make sure, yes, we can fit it in, and also this is how many fields we can get uh, on the property. It is just a spatial design study, not really a park. I'm not telling you this is the park that you're going to build, but the idea that you need something like this to be able to accommodate you know, this number of fields. And Evan, when he gets up to talk, is going to talk about some options we have for how this, this property could, could change from even from what I'm showing here. Other large renovation recommendations that we're making. Again, because we're displacing people, we're moving people around, you know, what else are we recommending? Johnson Road Park, where we're actually going to displace lacrosse and, and suggest they go to this new long field complex, um, we, we would develop two adult field softball complex there, two fields. The reason being, Houston Levy Park, where we where you currently have an adult softball park, um, is under high demand for the school system. They have a lot of you know, growth ambition and plans. They don't have adequate fields. They don't have adequate parking. They, there's a lot of pressure on them for expansion, and they don't have any place to do that. And so Houston Levy, it just makes sense for them to do that. Um, so we're displacing softball if that happens, and so we're recommending that that go to, a, um, to Johnson Road. The new elementary school site on Forest Hill Irene Road is where we're recommending your football be relocated. Um, it makes sense that the user groups that are going on those fields are you know, typically going to school at an elementary age. Once they get you know, to the middle school and older, they're playing on their school-associated fields. So we believe that we can accommodate those fields at that location. There's going to be 12 acres available for park there. So we really believe we can accommodate those fields at that location. Other school park sites like Riverdale and Dogwood, we're recommending the development of multi-purpose fields for just open play. We have a lot of comments about people who aren't in an organized sport that just want a field that they can go play on. So we're recommending that you know some of those those smaller school park sites be looked at for that to meet that need. And then perimeter fitness trails, we feel like in those locations there's the potential for court sport development, additional court sport development. You know, I told you about pickleball. We're gonna try and meet their immediate needs um, in uh, Cameron Brown Park and Bob Haley. Uh, but there's also was some discussion about futsal courts. So we think these these locations are potential to meet those needs. And then perimeter fitness trails. We had some comments about the desire for perimeter fitness trails, which have come a long way from when I was a kid and I remember them, and they were pretty basic and pretty nobody ever used them. But the ones that I, you know, we're seeing today are much more interactive, much just on very higher scale of fitness. So these places would be good locations for those. And then just completing your Greenway network and, com and completing a community buying and pay plan. You have a task force that's looking at that. We got a lot of good and very specific comments about that. So we definitely think that you should continue with that. Most importantly are your neighborhood parks. I haven't talked specifically about some of the neighborhood parks that you all gave us comments and feedback on, but they're not being forgotten. Um, there are recommendations, but they're much more basic. They're not what we would consider large you know, ticket items as some of the things I've discussed tonight. So we really you know, see that there would be a, there will be a five to 10 year capital improvement plan for those neighborhood parks and working with the neighbors and the HOAs to really make sure that that park ends up being you know, what the neighborhood would like it to be. Uh, we're not talking about major redesign, we're talking about replacements of you know, pavilions, ex extending some walking trails, we have comments about that, you know, playground replacements, things like that. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Evan and let him talk to you about some alternatives uh, to the soccer park. Well, first and foremost, thank you for your time so far. <coughs> We've shown you a lot of information. I've got a little bit of time ahead of me. I'm gonna be pretty bright and brief here with this. Uh, first of all, Evan Eva, I'm the Executive Vice President of SFA, which is the Sports Facilities Advisory, and one of four owners of Sports Facilities Advisory and Sports Facilities Management. Between the two companies, we plan, fund, open, and manage youth and amateur sports complexes and recreation complexes, wellness facilities, and entertainment facilities all over the country and internationally. We've done the type of work that we're doing here for over $8 billion worth of planned and operational facilities and worked with over 1,200 communities since we were founded in 2003. <coughs> so what we were running to do was to look 
considerate of all of the real needs of this local community, look at what the opportunities might be related to sports tourism. For those of you who may not be familiar with sports tourism, it's the fastest growing segment of youth and amateur sports. More kids are playing travel sports today than ever before, and more games are being played at a competitive level. So whether or not you yourself are a soccer player or a lacrosse player or someone else that uses fields, I guarantee you are related to or neighbors with kids who are currently going with their families and spending $900 or $1,200, somewhere in that range, to go to other communities and spend the weekend playing in a tournament. And one of the tasks of this project was to say, well, people are doing that all the time, more and more and increasingly, why couldn't we do that? And so we were engaged SFA, uh, Sports Facilities Advisory Again, to determine what the opportunity might be to look at one of these complexes or more, multiple ones of them, and look at the opportunity to develop a tournament class facility. So anytime we get engaged for a project, we start with asking why and what. Why do you want to do this, and what does it need to be um, capable of doing in order to be considered successful? And so to oversimplify what we've heard, three primary definitions of success. Number one, make Germantown a sports tourism destination, a place where people want to come, non-locals from more than 90 minutes away will come and spend the weekend here and grace us with their presence and their dollars in our community. Number two, create, uh, create a, a premier facility that serves Germantown residents. And so it's not about building a tournament complex for the weekends and fencing it off and not using it. It's got to be premier, and it's got to really serve our residents in unique and significant ways. And number three, creating a sustainable asset. So looking not just at pouring money into this to host tournaments and spend money on people coming in with their money, but instead to improve or at least maintain the financial sustainability of the assets that we're looking at. And so what John showed you earlier, I'll actually go back to it. I'm gonna call this the four and 10 model, right? This is four full-size fields and 10 youth fields to the south. We're looking at this concept, this is a realistic potential in terms of land that's 45 acres, but that's not the way that we would program it. We would still look to meet the needs of your soccer and lacrosse groups in the way that they said they want to be met. But instead of four and 10, we would look at a different model. So to determine what that model is, we start with defining the market. So we wanted to understand how big is the market that we're talking about. And for youth and amateur sports, we manage facilities in the Southeast, so we have real data on all of this. Um, <clears throat> we know that it's about a 240 mile drive time. On any weekend, people will drive up to that distance. Sure, there will be some teams from further, but the majority of the teams come from within 240 miles for a weekend tournament. That's 13.7 million people. Now, of course, not all of those people are players, so we wanted to look at who actually plays the sports. So this is a list of some sports that we looked at, highlighted in, well, they're highlighted in green. You might not be able to see, but soccer, football, flag football, lacrosse, four of those sports that this type of facility could accommodate. And in reality, there are five additional sports, or six additional sports, that are regularly using these types of fields for tournaments. So we're just saying, um, how many people are actually playing, and what those people are like in terms of their demographics, this region, how many people are traveling, what kind of households do they come from, and while some of this is disturbing information because we have a trend that for travel sports, people who can afford to play are predominantly the ones who are playing, and some kids are being left behind, which is one of the reasons that it's so important to make sure that we're increasing access on a local level to great facilities like you will have here. We look at lacrosse, we look at soccer, we look at the comparison to some other sports, and in general, these are the types of people that you hope to bring into this community. They'll travel well, they'll bring their family, they'll spend money, they'll respect your community, they'll take advantage of your parks as well and use them and respect them like you would want them to be. So we know that these are um, typically the types of people that you will want to come into to your community. So we want to look also at what they're playing, not just are they playing, but what they're playing. We looked at over 130 different events. We analyzed them to understand when people are coming, how big their travel parties are, what they're doing while they're there, types of tournaments they're playing in. And this took us to seven different states in the area. We also want to look at where they're playing. So what are the facilities that you'd actually be competing with on some tournament weekends? And so we looked at over 35 different regional tournament facilities to understand what they offer, how big they are, what their amenities are, how they produce their tournaments, or how they host people. And what that gave us was really good insight into what the options were for this facility. So I mentioned that four and 10 model, we would make it an eight field model. 
eight full-size fields instead of 10 youth fields, we would convert those 10 to four full-size fields. One key point of consideration here, synthetic turf. It is a must-have for these types of facilities, and I'll go into some more uh, information on that here momentarily. But in addition to the fields, we want to make sure that people are comfortable out there. So we plan within that support buildings where you can have some team meetings and obviously restrooms and concessions and first aid and storage and those other pieces. So this is an example. This is Rocky Top Sports World in Gallagher, Tennessee. We planned, hopefully the fund opened and manage that currently. This is what one of those fields looks like. And this is actually smaller than the field that we're recommending here. But it's a synthetic turf field that is regularly used for soccer, for lacrosse, for football and ultimate frisbee, and field hockey, and quidditch, and if you were familiar, legitimately people play quidditch now, and they, and they travel for it. So, um, you know, always fun to joke about, but people are bringing dollars to new communities to play quidditch on a weekend tournament. So, we have a full financial forecast and economic impact analysis. We produce uh, institutional grade documents that are used on Wall Street on a regular basis. This is what you care about, right? First and foremost, there's an opportunity to, to, to do a lot of tournaments here. We aren't recommending that this is a tournament first complex. We're recommending that it's a community first complex. But within six to eight weekends per year, dedicating those fields in advance so that that can bring on those dedicated and pre-booked weekends outsiders in and also reduce those travel costs to your local teams, which is a major point because they are going and spending money elsewhere. Six up to eight tournaments per year. Now when people travel for these types of sports and when they would travel here, we've done a breakdown of what they would spend. $120 per person per day, and some change, on these six different categories. Hotels, restaurants, retail, entertainment, transportation, and other miscellaneous. So what that would also do is not just bring in people for days, and a lot of days, right? In the first year, almost 14,000 days. In years four and five, over 27,000 non-local days in the market. Now those are non-local days, so it's not 27,000 people, but if they're here for two or three days, it counts for two or three days for each of them. It would also put heads in beds, hotel nights, and the proliferation of your current hotel capacity, particularly in this part of the, the city, if you were to build on that acreage that we were talking about, 3,000 up to 64, uh, up to 6,400 room nights per year that would be added by these travelers, and that is 1.7 up to 3.3 million new dollars spent that would not be here but for those six to eight tournament weekends. Mm -hmm. So it's a significant impact and it's a significant tax increase for you as well. Hotel tax, sales tax, etc. So anytime we look at this, we think there are a lot of positives, but we want to be realistic as well. What are the challenges and what are the contributors to success? So first, challenges, available land. Right. There are a lot of tournament class facilities and tournament size facilities in the region. About 50% of them have more fields than these eight fields. Now, just because they have more fields doesn't mean they'd be significantly more desirable because how they use those fields, whether they're lighted, do they have proper restrooms, is there enough parking, how are they utilized, what's the quality of the fields. There are a number of factors. This would be a premier facility. Not the biggest, but certainly a premier facility. The second is the location of the site. If that were to be the site, it's close to the Memphis border, and it's not currently as close to your hotels, your restaurants, and your retail in Germantown that you would want. So we know that this would need to be a destination driver and also a development driver within the city for future plans in that part of the city to develop more hotels and more restaurants and more retail, thanks to capture dollars inside, um, <clears throat> inside Germantown. And finally, local and regional competition. I mentioned there are a number of com competitors. Mike Rose Soccer Complex, for those of you who are familiar with it, certainly one to be aware of, right? That is one of the premier soccer complexes in the southeast, if not the country. It does a great job, and um, we think that there is not a lot of opportunity to compete directly with, but we think there may be an opportunity to add to it. So going over the drivers of success, I'll start with where I end on the challenges, and that's with Mike Rose. Mike Rose is currently running 17, they have 16 fields, and they're currently running 17 um, real sports tourism generated tournaments per year where they have a lot of non local teams. Already three of those tournaments per year are using more than the 16 fields that they have. So they need more fields. They're currently piecing them out across Memphis primarily. But this location is 
very close to microbes, it would be a natural place for those extra fields uh, to be used. Additionally, four of their 17 tournaments, beyond those three that are already using additional fields, already have more than 150 teams at those tournaments, so they will in the future need more fields as well. Again, natural, uh, natural opportunity. Number two is synthetic turf. So I mentioned the synthetic turf being a primary um, recommendation here. That's because the flexibility in use, not tearing the fields out, but having a, a question of do we want to run lacrosse because we're also running soccer, and what does that do for today and tomorrow in the next four weeks or eight weeks or a year on natural grass fields. But you can also play a lot more games because you don't have to rest them, and they drain 16 to 18 inches per hour, so rain is not an issue. You don't play during lightning, you still play during and after rain for the most part. So um, that allows you to play so many more games and that increases the opportunity to run practices and games and tournaments throughout the year. And finally, as I mentioned before, opportunity to serve as a backup location. Mike Rose will get rained out. They have great fields, they drain very well, but there are weekends where people have been planning on coming to Mike Rose for a soccer tournament for 12 months or 18 months. And one week before, they find out, oh, look at the weather forecast. Well, this provides the backup where they're still going to come from Chicago and Indiana and other places because they know that even if Mike Rose isn't playable, right across the street, there are synthetic turf. They'll get their games in, and that's a key driver. And the third is to recognize what you already have here and what you will continue to grow in the future. Germantown is a premier destination. Already sub-regionally, if you're looking within 60 or 90 minutes, people know Germantown. If you were to ask people who are coming from Chicago to Germantown, they'd say somewhere east of Memphis, probably most of them is what they would say currently, but that won't be the case. You're going to make this additional investment and grow your city, and you are already known and starting to be even more known as a premier residential location. This will help, and this will take advantage of that. So we know Germantown is a desirable location. It will continue to be, and this can actually help and enhance that. So. We always start with the why and the what, and I want to go back to those. So the first uh, question for definitions of success was, can Germantown be a major sports tourism destination? Some insights there, you have the opportunity to host more than eight, but we're recommending eight tournaments, capping and playing in advance, tournaments per year, and we believe it's imperative that in order to move forward with this plan and create this tournament asset, you should add to and not compete with or work with not compete with Mike Rose and the tournaments that are currently coming. So if you do that, that's a check mark. Number two, creating a premier facility that expands access for your residents to use high quality facilities. Number one, you can increase by 200%, three times as many games is an increase of 200% uh, of 200% uh, over the fields, and you have to commit to multiple uses, right? It's gotta be a soccer, and a lacrosse, and a football, and a Quidditch facility, right? You have to commit to this being multi-purpose, not on the soccer complex. So that's a check. And number three, can it be a sustainable asset? Well, tournaments generate between, in this market for these fields, we've done the financial forecast, between fifteen and $25,000 in a weekend, it can be generated. That's money from outside that wouldn't be here, and you certainly wouldn't generate that from your local teams. So on those weekends, generating a lot more revenue, and also decreasing the, the operating expenses. It's a lot less expensive to operate turf than it is to mow grass and oversee it and rest it and sod it and aerate it and do all those things. So uh, if you commit to synthetic turf, this also gets a check mark. And turn it over to John for the end. All right, so we're almost done. Um, I just wanted to kind of hit one last topic, and that's your forward 2030 plan. A lot of you might have participated in this. I know it was a big effort for the city, and this plan needed to support some of the, the ideas and principles in that plan. So just kind of a, as a broad brush, we sort of looked at you know how this plan meets some of the needs um, addressed in, in there, and we really feel like you can see the percentages of city services and finance, economic development, education, land use and transportation, natural resources, public safety, quality of life, technology, and wellness. Those are your key performance areas. And a lot of the recommendations that we're making in this plan really address a lot of those um, performance areas. And I think that's important. I mean, we wanted this plan to be consistent with what you've all said that you wanted moving forward for our city. So I just wanted to hit that one topic. 
I mentioned that this will be available online. If you go to the city website, you'll be able to get a link to it. We're also providing on there um, a link to a survey monkey where you can go in and just write some comments if you would like about you know some of the things that we've presented here tonight. I also mentioned for those of you who participated in our open house previously, you know the routine. We have three tables here. Um, I believe we have Municipal Park in the corner. We have um, the Parks on Poplar Pike, which is you know all of the consolidated groups, the Farm Park, the Cherry Horse Show space up here. And in the back, we have Pamela Brown and Bob Haley. We have post-it notes, we have pins. Love for you to look at the plan a little closer, make some comments, we'll be there so we can answer questions. Um, and uh, just get you some feedback. I mean, at this point, like I said, we had to start somewhere and this is where we're starting. So we're looking for you to give us some, uh, some of your thoughts and uh, so we can move forward. Thank you for all of your participation in this, not just tonight, but the previous meetings. We, like I said, had some great, great input and a lot of participation. So it helps us feel confident in what we're recommending.